Hello, we have made it to chapter 10 in materials kinetics. Uh, the subject of chapter 10 is motion of dislocations and interfaces. Uh, in the past couple of chapters, we have dealt with diffusion in crystalline and polycrystalline materials. We've noted that dislocations and interfaces provide pathways for uh, much faster diffusion compared to diffusion within crystals themselves. And today in chapter 10, what we're going to do is study the motion of dislocations and interfaces themselves. The outline for today is first to cover dislocation motion. Uh, we're going to cover the different driving forces um, that act on dislocations that cause movement of those dislocations. We're going to cover the two basic types of dislocation motion, which are dislocation glide and dislocation climb. Then we're going to switch over to interfacial motion, deal with the thermodynamic sources for that motion. We're going to study the motion of crystal vapor interfaces, uh, the motion of interfaces during solidification, crystalline interface motion, and then classify uh, two different types of interfacial motion as conservative and non-conservative interface motion. So recall from last time, we have two main types of dislocations. Uh, there are edge dislocations as shown here on the left, and screw dislocations as shown here on the right. Uh, remember from your crystal chemistry class that we can uh, describe the, uh, you know, the magnitude and direction using a Berger's vector, which is if you make a circuit all the way around the dislocation, um, the difference here between the uh, beginning and the ending point gives you the Berger's vector. And for an edge dislocation, the Berger's vector here is perpendicular to the dislocation line. And for a screw dislocation, the Berger's vector is parallel to the dislocation line. The Berger's vector uh, represents the magnitude and direction of the lattice distortion that results from um, this type of dislocation. Uh, recall also that dislocations provided pathways for fast diffusion. Uh, so significantly faster diffusion occurs along this uh, linear dislocation defect compared to diffusion within a single crystal. Um, this is by no means a universal conclusion, but there is some evidence that edge dislocations here on the left lead to faster diffusion compared to screw dislocations on the right. Uh, perhaps it's because they, they tend to open up a little bit more and have less resistance um, along that uh, diffusion pathway. Now, the motion of dislocations themselves is one of the fundamental topics um, in material science and has uh, an important effect on many different types of kinetic processes, including plastic deformation of crystal materials, which can occur even at low temperatures. Now, the motion of dislocations can always be broken down into two components, known as glide and climb. Dislocation glide is movement of the dislocation uh, along the glide plane, also known as the slip plane. And dislocation climb is movement orthogonal to the glide plane, so it's movement uh, in the normal direction compared to the glide plane. Now, first, what are the different driving forces that can lead dislocations to move? Uh, dislocations in crystals tend to move in response to the forces exerted on them, where the dislocation movement causes a reduction of the energy of the system. Some of the relevant forces for dislocation motion include uh, any type of mechanical forces that are operating on the system, something called the osmotic force or chemical force, and then finally, a curvature force related to um, the curvature of the dislocation. So let's go through each of these three forces here briefly. Uh, starting with the mechanical force, uh, we can describe this based on uh, a stress tensor at a given point in the material. The stress tensor here is given by this bold sigma, and this is a three by three matrix that contains nine components that completely describe the stress state at a given point in a three-dimensional material. Um, a graphical representation of this is shown on the right, 
And the key thing is that in this um, tensor here, in this three by three matrix, um, the first index is the face on which the stress is acting. And the second index is the direction in which the stress is acting. So if it is acting on um, the third face uh, along the first direction, that would be the sigma 3, 1, and so on. Uh, so you can see that on the top here, these are, are sigma that all start with the number 3, the index 3. These are all stresses that are acting on this um, third face and they're acting along the one, two, and three directions. On the left here, these sigmas all have one as the first index because they're all acting on uh, this first face and then along either the first, second, or third directions. And then um, finally here, uh, these sigmas in the front are all acting on the second face along the first, second, or third direction. So the, the complete stress state is given by the combination of all nine of these components to the stress tensor. Now, taking that stress tensor here, uh, this bold sigma, we can calculate the mechanical force that is acting on um, an individual point in the dislocation or the force acting on a segment of the dislocation in the crystal where there is a stress field. And this uh, force is calculated from this peach Kohler equation as shown here, where on the left-hand side, this is the mechanical force vector that is exerted on the dislocation. Um, and then this is given by uh, the transpose of the Berger's vector. So the superscript T here means the transpose of the Berger, Berger vector. That is dotted with the stress tensor and then crossed with a um, unit vector that acts tangent to the dislocation. Um, this dot product here is what gives you the overall force vector um, acting on that segment of the dislocation. So it's basically defined by uh, the Berger's vector of the dislocation and the uh, stress tensor in terms of the nine components of stresses. Uh, this transpose of the Berger's vector dotted with the stress tensor can be represented uh, also by this uh, D vector shown here. And when that gets crossed with the unit vector tangent to the dislocation, uh, that's what gives you the overall uh, mechanical force vector. Um, now, the second type of force that can uh, be the driving force for dislocation is called the osmotic force, also known as the chemical force. And the osmotic force results from uh, any non-equilibrium concentration of vacancies uh, near the dislocation itself. So if you remember from a couple lectures ago, we introduced um, the fact that we can get the equilibrium concentration of vacancies from the equilibrium constant of the defect reactions that create those vacancies. Now, if locally around the dislocation, the, con the concentration of vacancies is out of equilibrium, either you have too many vacancies or not enough vacancies, then that presents a local chemical force known as the osmotic force that seeks to equilibrate that local concentration of vacancies. So for example, if supersaturated vacancies are present, in other words, if you have too many vacancies locally, then they can diffuse to the dislocation and be destroyed there by the dislocation by causing dislocation climb, as we will see uh, a bit later in this lecture. And here on the right, you can see some various possibilities um, for edge dislocation climb that can um, you know, be due to the destruction of excess vacancies. Either the vacancy here A can be destroyed directly at um, a jog here at, in the dislocation. Um, the vacancy can jump into the dislocation core. Um, the, the attached vacancy can be destroyed at the jog or can be um, diffused along the core itself. And I'll, I'll show you exactly how this happens uh, a bit later in the lecture. And now with this osmotic force, uh, this is an effective force that is exerted on the dislocation if the concentration of point defects, specifically vacancies, is out of equilibrium. 
And for supersaturated vacancies, the destruction of vacancies lowers the free energy of the system. For subsaturated vacancies, if we don't have enough vacancies, then the creation of additional vacancies would lower the free energy of the system. And the equation here that describes this osmotic force acting on dislocations is given by um, this unit vector here that is normal um, to the plane crossed with our B vector, where this B vector is defined as the Burgers vector here, little a times uh, Boltzmann's constant times the temperature divided by some effective uh, atomic volume times now, and then this is the key part, the logarithm of the ratio of the actual concentration of vacancies at that point in the system or that local region of the system relative to the equilibrium concentration of vacancies. So if the local concentration of vacancies is equal to the equilibrium concentration of vacancies, then this ratio would be one, the logarithm of one is zero, and then you'd have zero force acting um, from the uh, osmotic uh, force here. But if you've got uh, a local concentration that is smaller than the equilibrium, then this ratio would be less than one, which means the logarithm of that would be negative. So you'd have the force acting along um, that negative direction. Uh, if you have a supersaturation of vacancy, so if this X sub V is greater than the equilibrium amount, um, then you'd have a ratio that's greater than one and the logarithm of that would give you a positive number. So you can see how you can switch the direction of the osmotic force depending upon whether you have X V is less than or greater than the equilibrium concentration of vacancies. But in either case, um, this osmotic force is going to uh, lead to either the creation or the destruction of vacancies to try to get the local concentration of vacancies to be equal to the equilibrium concentration that you would expect from um, the Gibbs free energy of that defect reaction. Now, the third force that we consider acting on dislocations is the curvature force. Um, if the dislocation is curve, so if it's not straight, if it's curved, then the energy of the system can be reduced by shortening its length, basically by straightening out the curvature. Um, and one can represent the energy of um, this circular dislocation loop uh, with the equation shown here, uh, where this would be um, the shear modulus. So a higher shear modulus means a greater amount of energy that is associated with having that circular defect. Um, the Burkers vector squared, which is just the magnitude of the Burkers vector squared. The Poisson's ratio here is in the denominator. And then this capital R is the radius of the dislocation loop. And this is being uh, expressed relative to some cutoff radius where we assume that the curvature doesn't matter anymore. Um, so basically, the uh, any curvature of the dislocations it leads to a driving force that is going to um, attempt to straighten out that curvature until it gets to the point where um, it reaches the cutoff radius. Now, with this curvature force here, um, this curvature force uh, can be uh, lead to this radial climb force that exists to increase the radius of the dislocation loop. And um, the magnitude of that force here can actually be approximated uh, by the shear modulus uh, times the magnitude of the Burkers vector squared divided by um, the radius of, of that uh, dislocation loop. And this can be generalized to any particular segment. If, if you've got a dislocation that has some sort of arbitrary curvature or the curvature is changing along the length of the dislocation at any specific segment, um, we can generalize this by having the, uh, the curvature force here, this F um, vector sub kappa for curvature force is approximately equal to the shear modulus times the Burgers vector squared divided by the radius times the principal normal, so the, the unit vector directed towards the concave side of the curved line. And this would always be a force that acts to increase the radius of curvature, or in other words, to act to straighten out the curvature. Now, taking these three forces and putting them together, if you add up all of these three force vectors, you would get the total driving force that is acting to um, 
induce motion of a dislocation. So this total driving force here, this F vector, is the summation of the mechanical force, F sub sigma, which is given here, this D vector that we calculated, um, crossed with our zeta, um, plus the osmotic force, uh, which is shown here. This is the result of the um, disequilibrium of vacancies locally, plus the curvature force here, this F sub kappa. So just taking these three equations from the previous slide, adding them up, that gives us the total force that is acting on a dislocation to try to cause motion of that dislocation. Now, two different types of dislocation motion. There's dislocation glide and dislocation climb. Uh, let's start with dislocation glide. And the way that you can think about the various steps of dislocation glide is that the motion here is kind of similar to the motion of how a caterpillar moves. So a caterpillar has a, a long uh, set of body segments here, each with a pair of legs. Um, and the feet, of course, can, can be kind of sticky to the, the ground that they're walking on. And how does this caterpillar move with so many very short, sticky legs? Um, the way that it moves is by creating a defect in the line of this caterpillar and then propagating that defect forward. So the, um, the rear end of the caterpillar here moves first. So this is going to move over to the right, and this creates a kink in the line here of the caterpillar. So the, the back legs here move forward. It creates this um, defect here, and the front part and the middle part of the caterpillar haven't moved at all yet. Um, the way the entire caterpillar moves forward is by propagating this defect. So this kink here in the caterpillar is going to move to the right. As it moves to the right, you can see that the the um, legs that are behind the defect are moving forward. It's lifting up the legs in, uh, as it's getting closer to the head of the caterpillar and propagating that whole defect forward until the defect reaches the head, at which point the entire body of the caterpillar has moved forward. So it's very similar um, following this notion of dislocation glide in your crystalline material, uh, where you've got some shear force that is acting um, on the material. So if this is our dislocation, and let's suppose that we have a shear force that is acting along um, the glide plane or along the slip plane of the material. Um, this, uh, this kind of point at the tip of the dislocation corresponds to uh, the defect here in the caterpillar, where you've got uh, an extra plane of atoms here in the upper part, and then uh, one missing plane of atoms here in the lower part. And with dislocation glide, what happens is that the defect is going to move. So the atoms themselves uh, are not moving all along um, this entire plane, but it's really passing the defect along each kind of half layer of atoms. So let's see how this works here, is that uh, when you've got shear acting on the dislocation, um, this atom is then going to move to the left, bond to um, this half plane, and then this effectively moves the uh, the location of the dislocation one plane over to the right, uh, because this atom is going to kind of annihilate the dislocation in that plane and create this new dislocation in the plane to the right of it. So it's effectively moving the defect one plane over to the right. This is the same thing as moving this kink in the caterpillar a little bit to the, the right based on the motion of the legs. As we continue, the bonding keeps switching um, in this plane right below the, the front of the dislocation, um, where you have this uh, atom here trying to form a, a new bond with um, the ending of the dislocation that effectively moves the dislocation to the right. And this just proceeds um, across the material itself. So the dislocation is gliding along this glide plane as a result of um, the change in the bonding configurations, uh, much like this caterpillar moves. And one of the things that you'll note about um, this dislocation glide process 
is that it's not changing the overall volume of the crystal. It's also not creating dis, uh, creating um, vacancies or annihilating vacancies. So dislocation collide is conservative from the point of view of vacancies. It's not changing the vacancy population. It's also conservative from the point of view of volume because it's not changing the volume of the crystals. Now, the next type of dislocation motion is called dislocation climb. And dislocation climb uh, depends on either creating or destroying vacancies. Now, there are two different types of dislocation climb depending upon whether vacancies are created or annihilated. Uh, with positive dislocation climb, this annihilates a vacancy. So this is going to lower the local population of vacancies. And as a result, the crystal is going to shrink in the direction perpendicular to the extra half plane of atoms, since the atoms are, are being removed um, from that half plane. So by eliminating a vacancy, the volume of the system goes down because the crystal is shrinking to get rid of that vacancy. The opposite of positive dislocation climb is negative dislocation climb. With negative dislocation climb, um, it is creating a vacancy. So this would occur if you don't have enough vacancies locally. If you need to, if there's an osmotic force that um, desires the creation of new vacancies to get closer to the equilibrium concentration of vacancy, then there is a force to undergo negative dislocation climb, which creates that additional vacancy. And as a result of creating a new vacancy, the crystal volume is actually ex expanding a little bit. In other words, the crystal is growing in the direction perpendicular to the half plane. Now, if you have a compressive stress in the direction perpendicular to the half plane, this promotes positive climb because a compressive stress is acting to shrink the crystal. And one of the ways to shrink the crystal is to annihilate vacancies. If you have a tensile stress, the ten tensile stress is trying to pull the crystal apart. And this is going to promote an increase in the volume of the crystal. In other words, it's going to promote the creation of new vacancies. So compressive stresses um, can also act uh, to create positive dislocation climb. Tensile stresses can promote negative dislocation climb. So this comes back to you know, both the osmotic force, which relates to the non-equilibrium of the local vacancy population. And then mechanically, you can also have mechanical forces that are compressive or tensile. This is in contrast to dislocation glide, where dislocation glide occur because of shear forces. The shear for forces are volume conservative. They neither create nor annihilate vacancies, um, but compressive or tensile forces will change the overall volume of the system by either creating or annihilating vacancies. So compressive tensile stresses um, would tend to promote dislocation climb, whereas shear stresses would promote dislocation glide. And this is one of the main differences be between glide and climb, since glide is caused only by shear stress, not by uh, compressive or tensile stresses. Now, what happens here with positive dislocation climb is that with positive dislocation climb, we are going to annihilate a vacancy either with um, direct application of compression or having an effective compression force um, from the osmotic force. If you've got too many vacancies here and we need to annihilate a vacancy, or if you've got direct application of compression, that's going to push the crystal together that also favors annihilation of a vacancy. And the way that this works is if you have the dislocation um, line here, and if you've got a vacancy that is near the, the tip of the dislocation, um, this vacancy is going to migrate uh, over into this location. This um, plane of atoms here just below the dislocation, the tip of the dislocation is going to move in. So this atom here on the right moves to the left and it fills in um, this local spot. Um, and this leads to an overall compression of the system there. So this is what's happening is you've got um, the vacancy and the atom um, exchanging places. And then you've got an overall compression that is going to shrink this open space here of the vacancy. So it's no longer considered a vacancy. Let me show that again. 
here you've got the vacancy and this atom here. And as compression takes place, they are switching places. And then um, you've got uh, the atoms that, are, that will be pushed in, eliminating that vacancy. So as a result, the dislocation actually shrinks um, by one atom. Um, now, the opposite of that is negative dislocation climb. With negative dislocation climb, this can result from tensile stresses uh, or a, an osmotic force, which is an effective tensile stress to create new vacancies. And this ends up being the opposite of positive dislocation climb, where we are going to increase the length of the dislocation by one atom by having one of these atoms diffuse into um, this upper plane here uh, that makes the dislocation uh, one atom or one uh, lattice distance longer. Uh, and then this is going to leave behind a vacancy uh, as the tensile forces act to tear apart this particular plane. So let's see what happens there. Is that this atom is diffusing here and leaving behind a vacancy. Uh, as So as this plane below the dislocation gets pulled apart, this has effectively created a new vacancy. Now, um, next up is interfacial motion. Um, so going beyond dislocation motion to the motion of interfaces, um, you know, while most engineering materials are used in their solid state, um, processing of these materials often involves precipitation from either a vapor or a liquid phase. Um, as a result, um, we care a lot about the vapor to solid transformation or the vapor to liquid transformation, which is known as condensation. Um, and this usually results from a deposition of atoms or molecules from a supersaturated vapor. And then we also care about the liquid to solid transformation, which is known as solidification or crystallization. And this results from cooling a system below its liquidus temperature. So in any of these cases, you have phase changes from uh, either the vapor or liquid state to going to uh, either the liquid or the solid state. So this necessarily has interfaces between different phases of matter. Um, and all of these phenomena here occur at these distinct interfaces in the system. And the motion of these interfaces governs the rate of growth of the new phase. So if you are creating a new um, crystal, say through vapor deposition from a supersaturated vapor, um, you're depositing atoms from that vapor onto the surface of the material and therefore the interface between this growing crystal and the vapor is changing as the crystal itself is growing. Now crystallization from a liquid is a topic that we're going to cover in detail in chapters 14 and 15 in the book. So in this particular chapter we're going to focus on the motion of crystal vapor interfaces and then come back to um, the crystal liquid interfaces a bit later. So what are some of the driving forces for interfacial motion? Uh, as with dislocation motion, there's an effective driving force on a material interface if the movement of that interface will decrease the free energy of the system. The driving forces for interfacial motion can arise from any mechanisms affecting the free energy of the system, but typically these forces arise from two basic sources. First is volumetric free energy differences between the phases adjacent to the interface. And second is the reduction of interfacial free energy. In other words, there's free energies that are associated with having atoms in different phases. And if you change the volumes of, of those phases, that changes this overall volumetric free energy difference. And if you change the um, either the total uh, interfacial area or the surface tension, um, that will also change the interfacial free energy contribution. So the way that we can describe this interfacial free energy is by the product of the surface tension gamma. The surface tension gives us the free energy per unit area. So if we multiply that surface tension by the area of the interface A, this gives us the um, total amount of free energy that is associated with that particular energy. So this is the free energy per unit area, which is the surface tension multiplied by the area gives you the free energy contribution of that particular type of interface. 
then if you sum up over all the interfaces, that's the summation over all the interfaces I, that gives you the total amount of free energy from those surfaces and interfaces. What this means is that the interfacial energy can be reduced either by reducing the overall interfacial area, so reducing the A, or by redistributing the interfacial area to different types of interfaces that have a lower surface tension. What we want to do is, is minimize this um, total summation here, and the ways to do it are either to favor interfaces that have a lower surface tension, this is reducing gamma, or to, and or, to lower the overall interfacial area here, A. And so the reducing the product of the two is what gives you the reduction of the overall um, surface free energy. Now, let's consider the problem of crystal vapor interfaces. One method for growing crystals is condensation of atoms from a supersaturated vapor, which is something that's done, for example, in physical vapor deposition. You create the supersaturated vapor, and then the atoms get deposited onto a substrate where um, the crystal grows from that. So in this vapor deposition process, the atoms condensing from the vapor phase are incorporated onto the surface of the growing crystal. Hence, the crystal acts as a sink for the atoms deposited from the vapor, and this crystal vapor interface is moving as the crystal expands. The kinetics of the crystal growth process are quite complicated and involve a variety of discrete events at the atomic scale. Um, we're going to cover some of these in a bit. Um, now, in terms of vacancies at the surface, the interface between the crystal and vapor phases can also evolve in response to disequilibrium of the vacancy concentration within the crystal. So this is another driving force. For example, vacancies are annihilated when they diffuse to the surface of the crystal. So if you have a vacancy that's in the middle of the crystal, if that vacancy diffuses to the surface, then that vacancy is effectively annihilated. So diffusion of vacancies to the surface is another way to reduce the concentration of vacancies if that is out of equilibrium. So if there's an excess of vacancies in the crystal, then such annihilation would bring the vacancy concentration closer to its equilibrium value. And since the crystal shrinks as a result of vacancy annihilation, this process can also be considered as a form of crystal dissolution because the, the crystal is actually getting smaller. Now, if you look at the structure of a growing crystal uh, in a vapor deposition process, you will note that it's not a perfectly smooth uh, surface, that this surface has different layers of atoms to it, uh, as shown here. And these layers have edges associated with them, these so-called ledges here. And there can be kinks in those ledges, or um, there can also be add atoms, which are uh, individual atoms that are just loosely bound to the surface. So there's all these different features that can occur on the surface of a crystal as it is being grown from a vapor deposition process. So these surfaces at the crystal vapor interface have rough and irregular structures. Um, this structural disorder is a result of the random nature of the vapor deposition process. The roughness is especially pronounced at higher temperatures since configurational entropy becomes a more dominant factor governing the structure uh, of the surface at high temperatures. So for example, if you have the uh, surface shown here, if you were to deposit some atom onto the surface, from an entropy point of view, entropy favors wherever you have the greatest number of possible states, which would be, for example, just having an add atom sitting on any of these surfaces here, uh, because there are so many more of those positions available. From an entropic point of view, the deposited atom would favor just being an add atom on top of one of those surfaces. However, from an energetic point of view, it's more energetically favored for the atom to have more bonds, which means that um, having an atom deposited along a ledge here uh, is more energetically favorable than just off sitting on the surface. Also, the most energetically favorable would be filling in one of these kink positions here because that allows for more bonds to other atoms in the system.
However, there are a lot fewer of these kink locations and fewer of the ledge locations compared to um, just free surface locations. So there you have this fundamental trade-off between energy and entropy. And what is governing that are the process conditions um, when you're depositing the atoms from the vapor onto the crystal, such as the temperature um, of or the temperature that is used during the deposition process. So when we consider crystal growth from a supersaturated vapor, there are different types of elementary processes that can occur at the atomic scale. And some of these are depicted here. So A, uh, with A, there is direct deposition of an atom from the vapor to the surface of the crystal. So this atom comes down, lands on the surface. That is something that is entropically favored because there's so many different surface positions available, but energetically speaking, it's not the most favorable. Uh, next would be B, which is direct deposition of an atom onto a ledge. Here, this would enable uh, an additional bond because there's an additional atom there for uh, on the ledge for the new deposited atom to bind with, but there are a lot fewer ledge sites compared to uh, free surface sites. So energetically, the B is more favorable than A, but it's less entropically favored. Uh, that trend continues if we go to C, which is direct deposition of an atom at a kink in a growing crystal. So here you, in this kink, there would be um, an additional bond that gets formed. So energetically, this is even more favorable than B, but there are fewer kink sites available, so it's entropically less favored. So this, the balance among A, B, and C is really the balance between um, energy and entropy as governed by uh, the temperature of the deposition process. Other elementary uh, atomic processes that can occur are shown here. So D is the transport of a surface atom, which is called an add atom, into a kink. So if this add atom is already on the surface, it can uh, be transported into a kink to lower the energy. Um, also E, this would be the add atom diffusing uh, to a ledge, which would also lower the energy, but not as much as going to a kink. And then uh, F here would be if you've got an atom that's on the ledge that uh, diffuses towards a kink. That is another way to lower the overall energy of the system. So all of these processes are occurring simultaneously, and they all have different rates associated with them. They all have different um, energies and entropies associated with them. So each one of these has a different effect on the free energy of the system. Uh, this shows you a real example. So you can see how these different factors affect the texture of surfaces. This shows an example of a growth of thin films of entropy stabilized oxides. Uh, this is from Professor John Paul Maria's group here at Penn State. Uh, he has a, a, an amazing lab for physical vapor deposition. And what these images are showing are the different roughnesses that can be obtained uh, of this very complex um, mixed oxide, the so-called entropy stabilized oxide. You can see it's magnesium, nickel, cobalt, copper, zinc, scandium oxide, where they all have uh, equal proportions of um, each of the cations here in order to maximize the entropy of mixing. Uh, and this scan here at the bottom shows the relative height. So this is a relatively smooth surface on the left and then increasing surface uh, roughness as the process conditions are changing. In the case of this figure, what Dr. Maria is changing is higher oxygen pressure and higher oxygen pressure is leading to um, favoring the uh, entropic part of the growth here, which leads to a greater roughness of the surface. If it's lower O2 pressure, that is favoring um, energy over entropy, and that is giving a smoother uh, overall surface. So um, the interface between two crystals, now if we go from crystal vapor interfaces to crystal crystal interfaces, the interfaces between two crystals have additional configurational degrees of freedom, compared to the crystal vapor interface. And that's because of the directionality that is involved with crystals or the anisotropy of those crystals and how the two uh, grains uh, are aligned with each other or not. Uh, for example, crystal crystal interfaces can contain uh, such features as interfacial dislocations, dislocation edges, anisotropy, 
And owing to the structural complexity, crystal-crystal interfaces, they evolve through uh, an even wider range of uh, mechanisms. And we're gonna be covering uh, some of that a bit later, but as an introduction, um, I just wanted to introduce how this can be classified as either conservative or non-conservative interfacial motion. If you have the motion of a crystal-crystal interface, um, this can be classified as conservative interface motion in the absence of a net diffusion flux uh, of any component of the system. So in other words, if the crystal-crystal interface can move without having some net diffusion flux from some other part of the system, this is conservative from the point of view of having um, the same population of species there locally. This is what's called conservative interface motion. The opposite of that is non-conservative uh, interface motion. This occurs when you need to have some sort of diffusion flux of a species from some other part of the system to the crystal-crystal interface uh, because those atoms are needed in order to evolve that, that interface. So non-conservative motion occurs when uh, the motion of the interface is coupled to a long-range diffusional flux um, from one or more of the components of the system. Non-conservative motion can be further classified as uh, diffusion-limited, source-limited, or sink-limited. So non-diffusion motion requires some net flux um, from diffusion of some species. If the slowest part of the process is the diffusion of that species itself, that is what's called diffusion-limited non-conservative motion. This is uh, when local equilibrium is achieved and the kinetics of the interface motion are determined by the rate at which the atoms diffuse to or from the interface, this would be diffusion-limited. Um, as opposed to source limited or sink limited. This is when the kinetics are limited by the rate of species uh, becoming available or being accommodated at the interface. If um, it's source limited, then you're limited by the rate at which that species is becoming available. This could be due to uh, maybe the kinetics of some reaction that is occurring someplace else in the system. Uh, or if it is sink limited, this means that once the species arrives at the interface, it needs to be incorporated into that interface somehow. And if that is the rate limiting factor, then this is what we call sink limited. So there's conservative and non-conservative motion. Non-conservative motion can be classified as diffusion limited, source limited, or sink limited. Uh, here is an example of some interfacial uh, motion that can actually be pinned due to embedding of a second phase. So if you have, say, a grain here on this side, a grain on the other side, and some other particle that gets incorporated in between them, where you've got one of the grain boundaries here, another grain boundary there, um, this embedded second phase particle can be pinned at the interface between these two grains. Here, an interface between matrix grains one and two is in contact with the spherical particle, and it's subjected to a driving pressure um, tending to move the interface uh, forward um, past the particle. Uh, the interfacial energy causes the interface to be held up uh, at the particle and therefore bulge around it. So if you want to suppress interfacial motions, the, the incorporation of a second phase, um, such as these particles here, can act to inhibit that type of motion. Uh, final topic is dislocation hardening. Um, dislocation motion can also be inhibited by pinning from other dislocations. Uh, in other words, if you want to inhibit the dislocation glide or dislocation climb, if you've got a, a really large population of dislocations that are all acting in kind of different directions, such that um, the, dislocate, the movement of one dislocation is incompatible with the movement of the other neighboring dislocations, that's what's called dislocation hardening. So if there's a high concentration of dislocations in the material, the activation barrier for dislocation motion increases since it is difficult for the dislocations to move past each other. This dislocation hardening is also known as work hardening or strain hardening. And this is a common method for strengthening metals and reducing their ductility. Um, so with dislocation hardening, new dislocations are purposely introduced through metalworking. So if you've seen um, you know, a person who is uh, 
hammering a sword. The reason that they're doing that is to harden the sword by creating new dislocations kind of randomly throughout the metal. Um, so hammering or other metalworking processes can introduce these dislocations, and that leads to uh, a hardened sword in this case. Um, and when a sufficiently high concentrations of dislocations is incorporated into the crystal structure, it becomes less ductile. So to summarize this lecture, dislocations um, can move by two mechanisms, glide, which is movement along the glide plane or slip plane, climb, which is movement normal to the glide plane. Uh, glide is the result of shear forces and is volume conservative and does also, it also does not change the population of vacancies, whereas dislocation climb can either create or annihilate vacancies um, as a result of uh, tensile or compressive forces. Um, these dislocations therefore can act as either a source or a sink for vacancies. Um, kinetics involve the diffusion of vacancies, the motion of dislocations, and vacancy annihilation or creation. Interfacial motion results from effective driving pressures can be conservative or non-conservative, depending upon whether that interfacial motion is coupled or decoupled from long-range diffusional fluxes. Um, and that can be, the non-conservative motion can be diffusion-limited, source-limited, or sink-limited. All right, that is all for today, and I will see you next time. Thank you.